Hello and welcome everyone to this video podcast for human genetics. In this video podcast, we're going to begin our discussion of DNA, its structure, and ultimately how it's replicated. Throughout this discussion, we're going to focus on early experiments that showed that DNA was the genetic material. I'm just going to put GM for genetic material. And that DNA was a double helix. We'll also spend some time talking about DNA and RNA as they relate to their components and structure. Important, but this part here is a little dry. And then we'll end with a discussion on how DNA is replicated. So let's go ahead and get started with this first part here some of these early experiments. Now, sometimes we take for granted what the genetic material is. We now know that it is DNA, but it was not always known that, of course. It's also important to remember that the field of genetics, as a science that is, is a fairly new science. It's only been around for almost, say, 120 years, while people have been doing crosses for centuries. Actually doing it in a scientific manner probably started in the early 1900s shortly after Mendel's works were rediscovered. Once Mendel's works were rediscovered, we've already talked about how many scientists started doing crosses to see how their genes of interest and their organism of interest were inherited, and if they were consistent with Mendel's rules. Well, a few decades after that, people really became interested in what the genetic material was. And I want to spend some time going over this. There were many experiments that were done during this time that ultimately showed that DNA was the genetic material. But I'm only going to talk about two of them. And the first one is the experiments performed by Griffith. Frederick Griffith. This was one of the early experiments, and it really set the stage for the next set of experiments I'll talk about. And he worked with a bacterium called Streptococcus pneumoniae. All right, so why was he studying this bacterium? Well, it wasn't by accident he was studying it. He was studying it because in 1918, there was a flu pandemic. You may have learned about that from another class. During this time, around 500 million people were infected with the flu, and about 20 to 50 million people died. Almost 700,000 of those individuals were from America. So that's why he was studying this bacterium, to learn more about this bacterium and how it affected people. And so these experiments that were later very useful to understanding the genetic material were conducted in 1928. So let's talk about his experiments. First, let's recognize that there were two different forms of this bacterium. The first one, we're just going to call rough. And it's rough because it has a rough outer structure to the bacterium. This bacterium doesn't harm us. And he was working with mice, so it didn't harm the mice. And the reason for that, by and large, is because our immune system and the mouse's immune system could attach to the rough structure of this bacterium and kill it through proper immune activity. The other bacterium type we're going to call smooth. It's similar to the rough bacterium, except around it was a smooth coat made primarily of carbohydrates. And this one did infect and kill the mice, as well as humans, but obviously he was studying mice, and he wasn't infecting humans to see if it killed them. He was working with mice. Thankfully, he was. And the reason it killed the mice was because the immune system could not bind to it and attack it and elicit that immune response. So what he would do then in his experiments is he would take that rough bacterium and inject it into a mouse. And you will not be surprised to learn that my mouse drawing skills are, well, let's just say, horrible. But the take home point here is that when he injected the mice with this bacterium, the bacterium lived. And if you would take blood samples from this mouse, you would see no rough bacterium because they had all been destroyed. Now, when he took this smooth bacterium and he injected that into a different mouse, drawn equally amazingly, so the mouse died. And if you were to take samples from the mouse, 
you would discover that it still had this smooth bacterium in it. So next he took this smooth bacterium and heated it up, which degraded the bacterium. And so I'm just going to show lines here to show that the bacterium was destroyed. But it's important to remember all the parts of that bacterium were still there, meaning all the RNA, all the DNA, all the proteins, all the carbohydrates, they were all still there. It just wasn't a living cell. He then took that heat killed particles from the smooth bacterium and put that into the mouse and the mouse lived. Next, what he did was he took this heat killed smooth bacterium. So I'm just going to draw that with these lines showing the, the debris left behind. And he mixed that with the rough bacterium. Both of these on their own, this first column and the second column, allowed the mouse to live. When he took that and put it into another mouse, the mouse died. And when you took samples from the mouse, the only kind of bacteria that were taken from it, that survived anyhow, were smooth. We never put a smooth bacterium in it. Only put the rough bacterium and these debris particles from this smooth bacterium. So what happened? Well, he concluded that there was a transforming principle. Remember, he didn't call it the genetic material. I don't know for sure, but I'm not convinced he was really all that concerned about the genetic material because he was more interested in how this bacterium killed its host. So he called it the transforming principle. We, we later would call that the genetic material, which I'll just put GM, and still later it would be shown that that genetic material was DNA. But he didn't know that at the time. But he reasoned that there was something left behind from this smooth bacterium that could be incorporated into the rough bacterium to transform it, transforming principle, transform it into a smooth bacterium to kill the mouse. This is where Griffith's story ends as far as this discussion goes. Now, three other scientists picked up his story, his data, and wanted to try to identify what that transforming principle was. And it was a team of scientists Avery, McLeod, and McCarty. And they did their experiments in 1944. So this is what they did. They took the smooth bacterium that we've talked about on the last whiteboard, they heated it to generate those broken up parts of the smooth bacterium. And remember, as I alluded to, that inside of here would have been RNA, DNA and protein, as well as any other macromolecule. But these are the only ones I'm going to talk about. And they knew they took the debris left over and added that to a rough bacterium that that would transform that rough bacterium into a smooth bacterium. And if it were injected into a mouse, it would kill the mouse. So they wanted to determine which of these or if any of these were the transforming principle. And that they identified what was the transforming principle, they could suggest then that that was the genetic material. Because at this time in the 1940s, there was a lot of scientific interest in knowing what the genetic material was. So next they took the smooth bacteria, they heated it as they did before, and they removed the RNA. And so all that was left was DNA and protein. They removed the RNA through an enzyme called RNase. So why don't I show that like so? And then I'll circle this and cross it through so that we know that it's the RNase that got rid of the RNA. They then added the rough bacterium. And what they discovered was that transformation still occurred, suggesting that DNA or protein was that transforming principle. They did it one more time. They heated it up. And this time what they did was Instead of getting rid of the RNA, they got rid of the protein. And they did that with an enzyme called protease, just an enzyme that degrades the protein. They then added the rough bacterium. And what they discovered was, indeed, transformation once again occurred. And if they were to put that into a mouse, the mouse would have, of course, died. Now, lastly, what they did is they took that smooth bacterium, heated it up to get all that debris, and this time, they didn't remove the protein, they didn't remove the RNA, but they removed the DNA. 
So RNA, DNA still present. So RNA, protein still present. And DNA was removed with an enzyme called DNase. They then added the rough bacterium. And when they looked at the bacterium to allow enough time for transformation to occur, they observed no transformation. If you were to put this in a mouse, the mouse would have lived because the bacterium would have been destroyed by the mouse's immune system. So from this, they concluded that DNA is the transforming principle. And what they meant by that was that DNA was the genetic material. Many other experiments occurred after this that confirmed that DNA was the genetic material in a wide variety of organisms. I just want you to know the Griffith experiments and the Avery McLeod and McCarty experiments at the level of detail that we've described here. Now, after Avery McLeod and McCarty and others showed that DNA was the genetic material, there was a, a strong desire by scientists to understand and to discover the structure of DNA. Those who were trying to discover the structure felt, and rightfully so, that if we understood the structure of DNA, that that would hold the key to understanding life. A bit profound, but fairly accurate. So the late 1940s and early 1950s, there was what many would have described as a race to discover the structure. And there, there were many scientists and many groups trying to, the, trying to come up with this prize and I only want to talk about a few of them. The first one is Shargaff. He's important because we continue to this day talking about Shargaff's rules. And what he discovered is that adenines bind to thymines. And that cytosines bind to guanines. It was also shown later that the adenines and the thymines, when they bind to each other, they bind using two hydrogen bonds and guanines and cytosines. There are three hydrogen bonds between them. I put these in different colors because in a moment we're going to talk about the structures of DNA and adenines and guanines, they are purines and thymines and cytosines are pyrimidines. And we'll talk about that in a moment. If you're having a hard time remembering which binds with which, this is the trick I use. Guanines and cytosines bind together. I remember that guanines bind to cytosines because both a G and a C here can be drawn with a curved letter. And adenines and thymines bind together because they're drawn with straight letters. I know it's a weird way to remember it, but sometimes in the depths of one's mind, they come up with bizarre ways to remember things. I remember adenine and thymines, they have two hydrogen bonds because two and thymine both have a T at the beginning. Guanines and cytosines have three. And I just remember that because it's what's left. We'll come back to this later when we talk about replication and, and transcription. But this was a very important discovery. Now the next person I want to talk about is one of my favorite scientists of all time, Rosalind Franklin. She was at the time, probably the best X-ray crystallographer alive. And she very well may be the best X-ray crystallographer ever. And we won't go into great detail on how these experiments are done, but in essence, what she did, or any X-ray crystallographer would do, is they would grow the item they're trying to solve the structure of, in this case, DNA, and they would crystallize it. So DNA was in this crystal form. She then would shoot x-rays at this crystal and the way the x-rays bounced off the atoms of the DNA here created an array of radioactive particles. And of course I am simplifying this to a great degree in part because we don't have time to describe it and also to be honest I'm not an x-ray crystallographer and I don't know the details enough of how this procedure works beyond what I just told you here. But she came up with a structure that looks something like this. And your book has an actual picture of it. And it is famously known as Photo 51. Now, I couldn't look at this and tell you what the structure was. But people who understand this technique a lot better than myself could look at the way the atoms were being displayed and with other data in the field 
and were able to determine that it was a double helix. Now, on her own, she wasn't able to determine this, and that's where these other two individuals come into play. James Watson and Francis Crick. Of all these individuals, only James Watson is still alive today, and today is 2019. So if you watch this podcast in a few years, perhaps he might not be. I don't know. He's getting up there in age. Now, what these two scientists were, and I'm not trying to minimalize what they did, but they were model builders. They didn't necessarily go in the lab and generate data, but they looked at other people's published data, and in some cases, their unpublished data, and were able to get information from those data in attempts to build a model of what DNA should look like. They looked at Shargaff's data, they looked at some of Rosalind Franklin's early data, but they still were never able to get the model perfect. And so they were missing one piece of evidence. And lo and behold, somehow they came by chance to find photo 51. Now, it's incredibly possible it wasn't just by dumb luck they found it. There's a lot of evidence that James Watson, maybe in conjunction with somebody who worked with Rosalind Franklin, stole this photo and gave it to James Watson. And this photo, which had not been published yet, was used by James Watson and Francis Crick to ultimately come up with the structure of DNA as a double helix. They were able to publish this work in the journal Nature in the same issue Rosalind Franklin's work was published. And so together, they were able to solve this structure. However, it should be noted, and it would be unfair for me not to point this out, I believe, James Watson, and to some extent Francis Crick, did a lot to try to discredit Rosalind Franklin's work in this field and the importance that she had. James Watson went as far as to write a, a scathing book about her. Why, we don't know, but it was clear he did not want her to share the credit. You can look up James Watson. He has also found himself in other circumstances that perhaps say something else about his character as well, but I'll let you look that up. I do also want to say that James Watson and Francis Crick, as well as another individual, Maurice Wilkins, who was a scientist that worked in the same building as Rosalind Franklin, these three went on to win the Nobel Prize. Rosalind Franklin did not. And the reason she didn't is simply because she had died. The Nobel Prize cannot be given posthumously. It cannot be given to someone after they have died. I'm not sure why that's a rule, but it is a rule that has been in place for a long time. What's fascinating about Rosalind Franklin, though, her work helped three individuals or groups of individuals win the Nobel Prize. One of those was a Nobel Prize given for, for her work in solving the structure of a virus. I believe it was the first virus ever solved. It was amazing work. The person who won the Nobel Prize actually was a pretty good guy, and he gave Franklin credit for it. He was very gracious, unlike these guys down here. Okay, now that we have established that DNA is the genetic material and DNA is a double helix, 